by you. We'll be chatting over one of our scientists' favorite drinks, which we will make here on screen for them to enjoy. And we encourage everyone at home to partake in a beverage themselves. So unwind and learn a little with us. Let us know what you are drinking and share your questions for our scientists in the comment section. Today, our scientist is Dr. Jayatri Das. Jayatri Das hey, is- Ooh, are you there, Jayatri? I'm here, hi. Oh, hi, there's Jayatri, you just showed up, that's fantastic. Um, so Jayatri, before I take your drink order, do you mind just giving us a little bit about yourself and your role at the museum? But... Yeah, so I actually wear two hats. Um, I'm the chief bioscientist at the Franklin Institute. And I'm also director of science content. So that means I do a lot of stuff, you know, I've been talking about COVID-19 and all sorts of stuff, explaining science um, to our audiences, but I also do a lot of stuff behind the scenes. And I'm kind of hoping we might get into some of that today because it's kind of, it's, it's really interesting um, in terms of working on exhibits and programs and things like that. Awesome. Um, so before we dive into that, I definitely need to get your drink order. So what are we having today, Jay Autry? So we're going to drink a gin and tonic, which is like my summer beverage of choice, cool, refreshing, and it looks like summer out today, even though it's not quite warm enough yet, but uh, let's do it. It's always a good time for any type of refreshing drink. So we are going to make a gin and tonic. We're going to start off with our ice. Let me grab you some ice. Now, of course, the main ingredient in a gin and tonic is gin, um, which gin is pretty much any distilled spirit that is primarily ethyl alcohol and gets its primary flavoring from what berry? What, what is that main ingredient in gin? Do you know, know which <laughs> So I, I actually just learned about this, um, about some of the science behind the gin and tonic as we were getting ready for this. Um, so I actually didn't know before that it comes from the juniper berry. Yeah, it's uh, the original Dutch name for it was like Genevieve was like the Dutch word for juniper. So then when it kind of broke down in language, we got it down to gin. It's pretty fascinating. Um, yeah, no, so I, I, I don't speak Dutch, so you know, you'll have to fill in the gap for me here. I only speak Dutch after about three or four gin and tonics. So, you know, <laughs> we'll work with it from there. Um, so I've got your gin. Now the next ingredient, right? It's a very simple recipe because what's great is that the name of the drink has the recipe in it, is tonic water. Now, tonic water has a fantastic history when you think about water in general in beverages and then getting it up to a certain point. And so- Yeah, so much science here, it's great. There's a whole lot of science, it's fascinating. So the first person we can talk about is Joseph Priestley, right? So most people are familiar with Joseph Priestley as being the first to kind of isolate the oxygen molecule, right? To kind of contain that. But what he's also known for, but a little bit less famous, is the isolation of carbon dioxide into water. And it was- it's all about all, the gases. All about gases, right? Joseph Priestley, all about gases. And what was fascinating is he kind of discovered it by mistake because he had water above a fermentation tank that was brewing beer. And so typical during fermentation is you're gonna have an offset of carbon dioxide. The water started kind of catching that and you've got carbonated water, which was an amazing feat because during this time, and you know, we're about, like, you know, 1700s, people are looking for amazing medical properties and everything around them. And so a big one was spring water. So especially water that was by volcanic vents, all of those minerals was good for your health. But obviously not everyone lived by a volcano. You didn't have those ease of access of springs. So people were looking for ways to kind of give you that feeling. So someone carbonating water was a fascinating piece. Everyone's like, that is the cure-all. We've already figured it out. This is gonna make me healthy. So- Which I think know, is kind of hilarious because that's basically why people buy soda streams now, right? Oh, exactly. Like if Joseph Priestley could look today, he'd be like, it's that easy. I just gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's it? I don't need a volcano? So soda streams, you gotta thank Joseph Priestley. Anyone at home with one of those? Thank your man, Joseph Priestley. Um, so what's really cool is that he didn't want to take on a lot of commercial aspect of it. He was like, no, I like science. You guys can have fun with it, but I'll publish a paper and stuff. So it wasn't until a famous guy who we kind of all see on our time bottles anyway, let me get his name right. Um, what was it? Oh yeah, Jacob, Jacob Schwepp. So like Schwepp's tonic water. And he was like, 
oh, I can start selling this bottled water with the carbonation. So he started taking on some of that history and kind of simplifying it. And eventually he opened up a company in London. And the idea of selling these bubbles is he actually had three different strengths of product, of three different like bubble strengths. The first one was for the dinner table to relieve bilousness. So like, if you got some digestive issues, you get like lower tier bubbles. If you're so next- like the, heart, the heartburn medicine, right? The heartburn medicine, right? We're, we're learning a lot here. Water was like the cure-all. You throw bubbles in there, it's, it's magic. Um, the second one was for patients afflicted with nephritic syndrome, so kidney issues. Right. So, so that's like the double pump mm. on the soda stream. So it's like a vroom, vroom on that one. Then the third strength was for sufferers with violence, bladders, or kidney stones. Oh, yikes. Right? So again, just strengths of bubbles were your cure-all. Um, so other companies started kind of selling this water. And, you know, at some point they needed to figure out a way to make them unique. And so everyone was adding in all these flavors. We started kind of the first steps of soda water. But other people were seeing that we were already using a lot of herbs and, you know, trees and stuff as like a medicinal property inherent in them. So wormwood was a big one during that time, or mint. But another one was the, what's the name of this plant? It's called the cinchona tree. And it was popular in Peru, discovered by like Spanish conquerors. And through distillation and kind of separation, they realized that main ingredient in there that was allowing this kind of cure for especially things like malaria, malaria was quinine. Right. And so they were able to isolate this quinine. So they're like, perfect. You know, our troops are in India. You know, malaria is a concern right now. Great. But here's the issue of quinine. And I think a lot of people realize this who have a very sensitive palate is they don't like gin and tonics because they attribute it to what kind of flavor profile. They say it's very what? It's kind of bitter, right? Very bitter. So quinine was very, very bitter especially back then because they were trying to kind of use it for medical purposes. They're like, pump it full of quinine. Right. But it tastes great. So they were like, all right, we'll add some sugars to it. That'll help out. It's like, oh, cool. So now we've got sugary quinine water. Oh, let's make it fizzy. Perfect. And then other companies were doing this, but then Schwepp comes right back into the game with his official, what's it called? It's the... Uh, where is this at? I don't know. He took on this claim that he had like the best recipe for it. So now we've got our tonic water. It's bubbly. The troops are getting it and they're drinking it for prevention of malaria. And they're from London and they've already got like some alcohol rations. So now they've also got gin on their boats. And they're like, no, this is a great combination if I just mix my medicine with my other medicine and then add some citrus and we'll call it a day. And especially during really hot summer afternoons, you know, as you mentioned, a gin and tonic sounds like a splendid way to go. Um, so let me so, put so let me tell you, Adam, here. like I, I've actually, you know, kind of gone on this weird like cultural journey about gin and tonic. So, you know, my family is from India and, you know, when we think about the British, you know, and their colonial rule in India and gin and tonics being such a major part of it, you know, part of, you know, some of the speculation is that the, the gin and tonics actually kept them healthy enough from the malaria that it actually like lengthened the time period they were able to rule in India. So like, yeah, you know, that, you know, growing up, you know, that <laughs> whole conflict about how I feel about the British and my family heritage. Yeah. Really weird. And then of course, you know, but like, you know, Indian people, they like a good drink if it tastes good. <laughs> so then of course I thought about gin and tonics being like what all the uncles drank. Like it was, you know, this was an old old person drink. Yeah. Well it wasn't actually until I got to grad school that like gin and tonics were were kind of rebranded for me as that kind of refreshing summer drink and, you know, let's just Let's let's put the cultural <laughs> stuff aside. <laughs> Sometimes you can just enjoy a drink. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I had a conversation with my dad. He was watching some documentaries 
And he was like, oh yeah, in the 60s, people were like, I don't want to drink my father's drink. So they stopped drinking like whiskey and started drinking light things. He's like, why would anyone say I don't want to drink my father's drink? Cultural, you hear stories connected right. to it and- Like food and drink have these, you know, complex connections with who we are. I mean, you know, we, just, we all kind of work our way through that. <laughs> Uh, so I have your gin and tonic right here. I've got some lime in it. Of course, citrus was a big thing during that time as well because of like, you know, curing scurvy, which was great. So this right here is like a tall glass of medicine and it's 540. I think we're ready. Are you, are you ready for your drink? I'm ready for a drink. Well, here's your drink, Jadri. I hope you enjoy. Thanks, Adam. This looks uh, delicious. <laughs> looks good, right? I'm going to squeeze it. my lime right in there. Yeah, get that in there, that little bit of citrus. You got your citrus, you got your gin, you got your tonic water. Perfect. Um, All right. Cheers. So, cheers. I have, I have my water. I'm going to cheers with some water right now. So cheers. All right. Cheers. Uh, so if anyone is just joining us, we are at our search bar with Jayash Das. If you have any questions for her, send them in the comment section. I have my bar back working behind the scenes. Katie, she'll be sending me those questions through there. But we're going to get the conversation started with some topics that Jayatri and I were discussing earlier. So let me pull those up because Jayatri, I've worked with you for a long time, right? Like you, how long have you been with the museum? Gosh, like 14 years almost. <laughs> like 14, right? I'm actually wearing my 15 year pin. So we've been there for a long period of time working on and off on some projects and then you know, as a scientist, as an educator. So, like, I've worked with you, but I don't know that much about you prior to the museum. And so that's what I love about this event is that I get to know you a lot more as well. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your grad school work? Like, what led you to where yeah. you are? So I am a total nerd about evolutionary biology. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll tell you kind of how I got started there is I actually was really into math when I was in middle school and high school, except when I, a when I asked my parents like what I could do if I wanted a career in math, they told me that the only person that they knew uh, who did straight up math was an actuary. And I'm like, wow, I mean, sorry to any actuaries out there, but that did not sound like an interesting career <laughs> choice to me. <laughs> So I started, you know, I started reading about biology and I actually learned about how much math goes into evolutionary biology. And the thing that, that I think makes me curious all the time is how these big patterns that we see in the world, and I've always loved being outdoors and stuff, all come from like the littlest forces, like whether it's changes at the atomic level that drive chemistry, that drive our, you know, that drives our atmosphere, or whether it's changes in DNA that lead to you know, animals getting different traits and being able to survive and change. So that's kind of how I got excited about evolutionary biology. Very cool. And so I know you've been doing, um, where are we at? Let's see. Uh, you, so part of that was like your study about fruit flies, right? That was something yes. else. <laughs> I love fruit like, flies so much. <laughs> I know that most people try to kill them when they come in their kitchen. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've been but, noticing you know, but, in my house by my bananas, so I'm just like, I guess I'll yeah, say yeah. Bananas. Well, I, I, I'll have to get to the story of how I drove around the country for a month with like 10 pounds of rotten bananas in the back of my car at all times. <laughs> Was that for <laughs> research purposes or just personal? <laughs> A little bit, a little of me. No, just kidding. <laughs> it's okay, let, let me back up and, and, and get to that story. So, so fruit flies are a really cool animal to work on for science because not only are they really easy to keep in the lab and do experiments on them because we know so much about their genetics, but they also live in the wild. Um, so they're a great animal that you can do experiments on um, to test hypotheses about what's going on in the natural world. So that's how I ended up working on fruit flies um, for my thesis project in grad school. And I wanted to know how fruit flies change, how fast they breathe and how much oxygen they take in um, in different environments going from, you know, colder environments up, you know, up in Maine and Canada all the way down to like hot and humid environments down in Florida. And so 
I had to go collect samples. <laughs> so I, um, I spent the first summer of my grad school on a field expedition to collect fruit flies um, along what we call a latitudinal climb all the way of 30 degrees of latitude from, um, from Canada through Florida. And okay. it turns out the best way to do this is to set traps um, with rotting bananas <laughs> um, and, uh, and collect them along the way and try and keep them alive till I get back home. So from all the way up from Canada down to Florida. And so what time of year were you doing this? So this was in the summer. So, you know, the, we started in Florida and, wor and worked our way north. Okay. Um, before it got you know too hot, although it's still pretty hot and man, collecting flies yeah. in, in Florida is just unpleasant. <laughs> but it was really fascinating because you know I, I was collecting in like parks and wildlife refuges because what we didn't want was to collect flies that kind of came in on the local grocery truck, right? We okay. want we were hoping to get flies that had been living in that environment and adapting to that environment over time. So it's a great excuse to just like, you know, drive around and go camping with, you know, with your microscope in the back of your car as one does, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and so what were some what were some of those findings? Like what were their breeding patterns? What were like what were some of the interesting things you learned from that trip? Yeah, so what's really fascinating is that it turns out that the way that you, that all animals actually um, change the way they breed is super complicated. Um, so okay. we have an, we all have an enzyme called cytochrome oxidase that is the enzyme at the end, very end of the whole chemical pathway of breathing that actually takes in the oxygen. So that particular enzyme, cytochrome oxidase, is why we, why we need oxygen. Okay. Uh, and so we would actually measure um, how, like, how much oxygen different and how fast these flies from different environments breathe in. Turns Gosh. out that's actually a little bit harder than it, than it seems because <laughs> there's so little oxygen in the air that it's really hard to measure it. <laughs> so you actually have to do the flip but you, that you have to measure how much carbon dioxide they breathe out. <laughs> And gotcha. because it's actually a one-to-one -one ratio of carbon dioxide and oxygen in terms of what you breathe in, you kind of calculate backwards to get that. Okay, that makes sense. Last, so yeah, but the oxygen only makes up what, like 19% of our atmosphere? It's, it's less than that, I think, right? Even less, yeah. It's even less. Like, it's a very small percentage, so I'm trying to measure that. But CO2 coming in, yeah. okay. But, you know, it turns out that, you know, an, uh, animals who live in warmer climates tend to breathe faster. They have more babies, but they don't live as long. So there are these trade-offs that animals make to survive um, in warmer environments that they then like kind of shut everything down and manage to overwinter in colder environments. So you see these really dramatic changes, and it turns out that how you can um, change how much oxygen you use kind of underlies a lot of that. Okay, I mean, I guess it makes sense. Like if you're for hotter climates, you're like usually like more active. It's just that your heart rate, yeah, it's yeah, it's like, like you live fast and die hard. <laughs> the southern way. <laughs> <laughs> not I'm gonna, gonna, no, we're gonna, we're gonna take <laughs> not make any generalizations about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, very cool. So when we look at that, oh wait, what? So what can we like learn if we were to look at that research? What is some of that? What can we take out of it? Like it's yeah. great to know. That what's happening with the fruit flies, but then how do we interpret that and use it for our own research, our own studies? Yeah, I'm so glad that came up because one of the things that I totally geeked out about was uh, last year, um, so 2019, the Nobel Prize for Medicine was actually um, awarded for discoveries in this field. Um, so how animals can respond to different oxygen levels and regulate how much oxygen you take, that actually has a lot of impact for not just how we adapt to natural environments, but also for um, disease and, and, and health in terms of how we're able to respond to conditions where we can't get enough oxygen. Okay. Um, and so the award that was given out um, was given to scientists who discovered some of those mechanisms by which animals change um, how they breathe with respect to how much oxygen there is. Okay. 
Now, when it came to like measuring this, because I'm just now thinking like, how, how are you measuring that actual like, it's a, it's a, it's a tiny fly, you know, you can't really put a mess. So like, what was that measuring like? Like, how did yeah, you do Yeah, yeah. So it is even harder to, you know, not only are you measuring very small amounts of gases, but you're also, you know, trying to capture one fly and that's really hard. So you make it easier on yourself by measuring groups of flies. Okay, that makes more um, sense. So there's literally like, you know, there's this chamber, you put your flies to sleep enough to get them in the chamber, they wake up, you let them get used to it, and then you put in a very controlled flow of carbon dioxide, um, and you see how much of that increases on the other end coming out. So okay. it's not it's not really complicated in terms of the concept, but you yeah. think about, you know, how you design all of the machinery and, and you know, scientists tinker a lot. So this was a very like jury rigged <laughs> setup. <laughs> you, you got, a, you got like, a chamber of a bunch of fruit flies, some rotten bananas, a microscope, <laughs> all in the back of the truck. I I, I enjoy this visual. It sounds like a, a great road trip. Like it was. I mean, there was like there were ups and downs. Like I I was up in Maine, and you know the way that you catch flies like at, um, out in the woods is you you, know, you set up your trap, and it's kind of like very similar to the traps that you might set up on your kitchen counter to, to catch a fruit fly in yeah. So, you know, you have, you know, a container that has a, a narrow neck at the top, you put the fruit inside and you put a funnel on top. So the fruit flies are attracted to the smell, they fly in and they can't get back out because of the funnel. So that's all pretty easy. But then how do you actually get the flies from the trap into the vial that you're going to use to yeah. you know, give them food and take them home? Um, and you use this this device that um, that fruit fly biologists call a pooter. <laughs> Wait, what's it called again? A pooter. A pooter. A pooter. All right, that's what I thought you said. All right. <laughs> so essentially, you have you have your vial that has you know, like some food in it, and there's a stopper in the top, and there are two tubes coming out of it, and one tube goes in your mouth. <laughs> And the other tube is essentially your vacuum that you want to suck the flies up into. And it is very important that the tube that goes into your mouth has some uh, has some cheesecloth or fabric or you know something yeah. stuck on the other end so you don't accidentally suck the flies into your mouth. <laughs> um, right. And you know you just you just uh, walk around with your you know bag of bananas and your traps and your pooter. <laughs> One time I was coming out of the woods in Maine and, um, you know, I've got my grocery bag of, you know, of, of supplies and, and my pooter and, and this family looks at me and they're like, were you catching bears? <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> like, no, no, I, I, I was not looking for bears. And like, I'm like thinking, I don't even know why somebody would think I was looking for bears, you know, with what I have in my hand. And it wasn't until I think like last year that I learned that there are actually, there's a culture of um, hunting bears in Maine, um, and often people actually use grocery store donuts um, as bait for bears. Oh. And so when somebody saw me coming out of the woods with like a grocery bag and like, you know, you know, my outdoor, <laughs> you know, outfit that I'm wearing, all of a sudden, like, maybe that, maybe they thought I had donuts. <laughs> that's why I was hunting for bears so yeah it was funny like to make this connection like maybe 15 years later about like oh I wonder <laughs> yeah like were there any during the whole trip like you went from Maine you went from Florida to Maine were there any other places or like interesting stories like when you were gathering the fruit flies like maybe you besides staring at those like what were some other sites you saw or other inspiring pieces along that trip yeah well, I mean, there are so many insects in Florida. <laughs> we were down in the Everglades, uh, oh, and okay. you know that just the diversity of insects there is amazing, and like the size of the insects. Like that's another thing that changes with latitude is that um, you know you tend to see you know smaller you know smaller fruit flies um, at at uh, in warmer climates just because they're reproducing more quickly. Um, okay. But um, but the dragonflies um, were like birds <laughs> in Florida. Well, that sounds terrifying. <laughs> it's, but... it's, it's crazy, and, and you know, just 
it really makes you wonder about all of these mechanisms by which animals evolve. Yeah. Was there all, did you also learn, is there like a trip down there where people hunt like crocodiles with bags of donuts? Is that a thing down <laughs> south? Or is it just bears up in Maine and then nothing else? <laughs> I have not heard whether donuts are effective bait for catching crocodiles. So if there's anybody out there who knows, feel free to chime in in the comments. <laughs> yeah, you heard you ask Let us know any unique hunting habits down the 30 degree latitude. 30, <laughs> what, was, what was that line? Yeah. The, yeah. About way, right. it's just about 60 degrees down there. <laughs> 60 degrees. All right. Yeah. So if you have any of those hunting habits or techniques, definitely let Jayatri and I know. Spring 2021, we're going to recreate this entire experiment totally. yeah. um, while hunting. I, just, I, love I will it. say that my trip came to a very unfortunate end, however, because I was driving back down through Massachusetts uh, over the 4th of July and I stopped in Boston. And, uh, and it's the 4th of July in Boston, and my car got broken into, and oh, no. somebody stole my microscope, but nobody took my flies. So at least the samples were safe. There you go. But That's as important. Because if, if, if that, that was the end of my trip. <laughs> if those had gotten stolen, where would you have had to, like, retrace your steps to, to get, like, I, that? I, I don't even want to think about it. Because, like, yeah, this is oh. the other piece of, like, when you're doing field work, you know, you can't just go out and, you know, and do what you need to do without telling anybody, right? So yeah. you have to go through the process of getting permits and, you know, tell, you know, tell the forest service exactly where you're going to be and when you're going to be and what you're doing. And, like, if I had to do that all over again, man, I, I think I would have just, like, switched this project. <laughs> that's, that's very interesting. I can, yeah, I feel like I didn't go to grad school. Um, but I always wonder, like, what would that research field study be like? And I know, like, kind of switching gears, like, you at the museum help with our bioscience. Um, we see you every Monday giving us our COVID updates, which are fantastic. But you do a lot of other things at the museum, right? You know, you manage other scientists, but you also help with the spaces and the design, which yeah. fascinates me because my undergrad's in architecture. And so with that being my background, but working at the museum developing experiences, like exhibits are where those two intersect. So what are some like, like what are some of the exhibits you've worked on? Give me like that face of like, what's it like designing an exhibit at the museum? What's that like? So I, I, I love that because I think hands down designing exhibits is my favorite type of project. Okay. Uh, part of it is because you get to learn so much new stuff um, because the being being an exhibit developer is kind of like being a storyteller like you have to figure out what the story you're going to tell and in order to find one story you have to learn so much and talk to so many people um, and if you can't tell I like talking to people <laughs> oh, I, I wouldn't I couldn't tell I wouldn't know it <laughs> So, you know, the first big project that I worked on when I started the Franklin Institute was a Your Brain exhibit. And I remember my boss, we were just starting at the time, um, at the very beginning of the project, he, gave, he basically gave me assignment to write a description of what I think the exhibit would be. <laughs> and I was scared out of my mind, right? Because I just, I just come from being a scientist and, you know, I, I've done a lot of educational stuff and, you know, teaching kids and things like that, but I've never designed an exhibit before, and somebody's asking yeah. me to come up with an idea of, like, what an exhibit could be, um, because you always have to start from somewhere. You need something, you kind of, like, you need that straw man to say, okay, well, this works, this doesn't, you know? Yeah. And so, but, like, trying to come up with that from scratch was a, was a crazy challenge and still, like, makes me think about, like, <laughs> where we started from and where we ended up, because they look very different. <laughs> <laughs> so what was like the base of information they told you? They were like, it's an exhibit about the brain. You got this square footage and that's it. Like, yeah. was that all you got? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> I mean, what was nice though was that the way that, the, so it had already been decided that it was going to be an exhibit about the brain before I got there. Okay. Um, and, and, and so I give our visitors all the credit for that because we had given, I think, our members and our visitors a survey um, as to whether they wanted this new exhibit to be about the cell, the brain, or Ben Franklin. And, you know, we all love Ben, but the brain was 
clearly the obvious choice. <laughs> <laughs> you so, wouldn't you know, have Tom, been Franklin without the brain. So it totally makes sense. It's fine. Exactly, right? Um, so, you know, props to, props to our visitors uh, for making that choice because that was a really smart one. Um, but, but yeah, essentially you start with that blank slate um, and then you start, you know, talking to scientists and like reading, you know, about what, you know, this is, this is funny, this is like back even before blogs really became a thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> really relying on like the traditional media at that time. Um, like what, getting a pulse of what are, what do people know? What are they thinking about? What are maybe some misconceptions that they have? And trying to find those areas of overlap with, well, what are scientists learning about? What, what's kind of on the cutting edge and, and how do we, how do we bring those two together? Yeah. So you have, that's really cool. So someone actually just commented that they love the brand exhibit, that it's awesome. Thank you. And it's one of their favorite things. And I think what I also enjoy about that exhibit is that, you know, it's kind of the first one I saw a museum that really tries to kind of tell a story. Like it's a guided path experience of like different chunks of how we explore yeah. like the brain. And especially because it's, it's a very, what were some, it's a very big project, right? The brain is, is big. Yeah. It's not like the heart where you can study a lot. You're like, these are the chambers. There's a lot you can't easily see with the brain, like just looking at it. So what was like the, one of the biggest struggles you had when trying to come up with, with an exhibit with, you know, this gray mass? What was the struggle? <laughs> so I think the struggle was that on one hand, yes, we're, we're dealing with something that feels so invisible. Um, but at the same time, you're working with something that everybody's bringing in with them, right? Yep. So we always talk about how do we make science relevant? It is so easy <laughs> to make brain science relevant. Uh, and, and so for us, I think the biggest challenge is what to leave out because the brain is so interesting and there are things that I wish we had the space to talk about more of, especially when you get to like animal brains because they're so cool. Yeah. <laughs> but, but one of the things that we did learn from talking to people is that we're all really interested in how our own brains work. Um, and so that really ended up being that lens through which we were able to kind of organize that story. And I think, you know, to your point about, you know, how, how the exhibit is organized, this is something that I have, you know, really come to appreciate as a scientist. And, you know, you as an architect can appreciate this too, is how the physical experience influences how people learn. Yes. Right? So like one of the things that we learned um, from talking to people about what they knew about the brain is that they actually didn't know much about the brain because scientists didn't even know much about the brain <laughs> until relatively recently, right? <laughs> and so, you know, as we thought about how we introduced all of this new science to people, we knew that we had kind of had to walk them through it slowly because if you just bombard people with that much information, it's really overwhelming. Yeah. And at the same time, from you know a space and design and architecture point of view, that is the largest exhibit that we have in our building. And most of our other exhibits are kind of wide open spaces. You can choose where yeah. you want to go based on um, you know what strikes your fancy. But if you are suddenly you know faced with a, this gigantic expanse of space and there's choices of like seventy different things you can do, that's really overwhelming from an experience point of view. And so it was really nice to think about how both the experience and the learning elements kind of complemented each other in our decision to break up the exhibit into the series of smaller galleries. Very cool. Because like, yeah, when, like when studying architecture, like it was just the idea that it's the study of space and how we create it. And I remember yeah. like one of the first lessons just looked at, it was a very like abstract way, but it's just like walls. Like, right, to have a space, you know, you've got like some perimeter and then there's a point at which maybe you enter this space. And there was this whole discussion and study about like, if your walls are like this and your opening's in the middle, does that make me feel different than if the entrance like that? Or if it's like that, like if it creates an imaginary corner. Yeah. And it was, that was one of those parts that I remember learning and being like, maybe it does make a difference. Like when I walk somewhere is, do I not go in a certain direction because that opening is intimidating, you know? And then the other part is like the study of scale. Like you go right. somewhere, if you feel as if you're being comforted, is it overwhelming? Like there's all those decisions 
And when looking at like an exhibit on the brain, it's something that we all have inside of us, but from like a scale perspective, there's a, there's a lot in there. And we throw the heart, you know, we all have a heart, but at the museum, we challenge scale on that one and have a gigantic one you can walk through. So when it came to designing a space to physically navigate the brain, did you find that like the way information gets communicated in the brain translated to how people were? Like, did you ever see people as a normal? Oh yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's something so meta about talking about an exhibit, like how people's brains work in an exhibit about the brain. <laughs> yeah, that's the exhibit I want. I just want an exhibit about people learning about an exhibit while making an exhibit. Like, that's what I want. <laughs> but you're totally right because you know our especially the, the thing that struck me most is that emotional engagement that people have with spaces you know whether it's you know these unusual emotions like curiosity and wonder and these, these areas that of, of our brains that we can unlock with space and environment yeah. in a way that you doesn't work with the facts and that's where you know, that's what really fascinates me about learning from our exhibit designers and our graphic designers um, about how those experiences really influence how we learn. It's, it's so also because that just, it's something else that I learned as well is that it wasn't just the experience, but how you communicate it, right? You can have this fantastic idea, and especially as educators, right? We are passionate about something we like. So you're like, I want you to learn everything about the brain. But if I just give you like a wall that has a bunch of words, I might flip out. But if maybe you then use design to look at like color coding, how our brain receives that information. Like when your brain sees this color, it feels more accepting of information or when it hears this voice. Yeah. And so using that information to then create an exhibit about the brain, it just keeps just raveling. And it's a fascinating concept, especially for that. But I think what's really cool is that, you know, because it's about the brain, we each have our own experiences with the brain, listening in on eavesdropping on conversations that people have in the exhibit <laughs> is so fascinating because we each bring, you know, each of our brains is different, you know, no two yeah. brains are alike. Um, and so hearing people talk about how they're experiencing the exhibit differently is again this like fascinating meta conversation like all of those illusions that are in the exhibit you know even even people from the same family will experience them differently and it's such a great you know spontaneous conversation about the diversity of our brains so you're saying the next time we're in the building it wouldn't be a surprise if i saw you in the top of the neuro climb with like a notepad just like <laughs> listening in on people that's, i have that's spent many hours in the exhibit <laughs> But I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something funny, and here's a little Easter egg, that in a certain sense, I am always in the exhibit. <laughs> that sounds a little creepy, but if you walk into that first gallery of the exhibit, there's a, an, an experience where you can poke your finger inside of a head and feel the brain is kind of squishy, right? And, the, yeah. you know, and hopefully that is you know, kind of a surprise to people, um, and hopefully it inspires them to wear helmets and take care of their brains. But the secret is, this is kind of an inside joke, that that head is actually my 3D printed head. <laughs> so it's got even more meta. People are physically entering sort of the brain of the person who designed, yeah, that's a lot. I had a drink to really wrap myself. Well, every, every time somebody pokes their fingers in that, in that head, I kind of twitch a little bit. Just a little twitch. <laughs> my, it's my motor cortex, right? Yeah. <laughs> But, but, but this, is, this is like the fun part is that, you know, exhibits are really a labor of love. You know, we yes. all do it because we're so excited about it. And every member of the exhibit team that works on that exhibit is in that exhibit somewhere. That's very so, cool. I, that's, a, I, that's a challenge I'll throw out to the audience is look, you know, look at all the pictures, of, pictures and heads of people in that. And you might wonder who was part of the exhibit team. That, that that's really cool i like the idea of like that piece like final products having a piece of everyone that makes it um and so i know like you've done the your brain exhibit you've also worked with the sports exhibit right what are yeah. some stories that you have with like the sports exhibit well the sports exhibit was a whole different challenge because we were redoing an exhibit that 
people loved. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there used to be a sports exhibit. We had to redesign it to, to you know, reflect kind of more modern science and more modern aesthetic. But how do we maintain that while still keeping every, you know, the spirit of the exhibit that, that people love? And again, like we can't do any of this without talking to the people who use our exhibits. And so, exactly. you know, we, we always, you know, ask our visitors about what they think and what they like. Um, and so all of that is always really informative. Um, and what people love about the sports exhibit is how active it is. It's something that, you know, when we're teaching you to be healthy, we're actually helping you to be healthy as you're doing it, right? It's not like, yeah. here, just just read a panel about how important it is to exercise. No. <laughs> like, well, the whole time, do jumping jacks. Like, oh, I got this. I got this. That's not a jumping jack. This is, my bad. Either way, you know what I'm saying. Run in place. <laughs> but I think what the, what, what the challenge that we really embraced was to think about how to make that exhibit an experience about sports that appealed to everybody no matter what type of an athlete they were yeah. you know in the in the in the old exhibit one of the challenges we had been running into was that there was a this focus on professional athletes and you know for better or for worse in the world we live in you know professional athletes you know get hurt or you know sometimes they are caught using drugs <laughs> yeah. or they just age out and nobody knows who Shaquille O'Neal is anymore <laughs> you know? I remember that exhibit and like going through and then being a camp counselor during that time, and somebody like, "Who's that?" I'm like, "That's I get that's Tanya Harding. How do you not know right. who these people are?" But yeah, I get it. Like you constantly update, and I guess you narrow. You what was the direction that you went with it? You weren't focusing on professional athletes, right? So we really wanted to put the focus on you know as the athletes at home, no matter what level you are, no matter what age you are. And so that was one reason that the centerpiece of the new exhibit, you know, wasn't professional athletes. It was everyday people. Um, we put out a call to our staff, to our members, to the public to say, hey, do you want to be in the exhibit? Uh, and so those, you know, full life-size, you know, graphic figures that you see people doing different sports, um, those are all real people. Yeah. <laughs> They're not actors, right? I, I, <laughs> um, I, I, I met every one of them. Yeah, really cool. And everyone from like the seven-year-old who just started to play soccer um, to the, you know, to the master of rower who took up rowing late in life and now has a challenge to compete at the head of the Charles. Um, you know, part, the idea is, isn't necessarily about how good of an athlete you are, but it's more about how do you set goals for yourself and how can you use science to achieve those goals, no matter what your goal is. Yeah. That's a, I mean, I think that's a good idea of just looking at the entire, like the scientific process, right? When we think about any task, if we break it down, there's always this idea that you are trying to achieve something, right? right. So if you're an athlete, you want to be the best version of that athlete. If, exactly. So you, there's training and there's practice. If you want to be a surgeon, you want to be the best surgeon. So you're going to practice and you're going to take tests and be like, and learn. I feel like that's an interesting way to see how like any exhibit we do kind of like a kind of like views it. It's like anyone yeah. could be this person. It's the same process. There's technology that assists. There's research. Um, and I never really thought of a sport exhibit being that. Like if that's what it is. Like if this is what you want to do, this is how the best to be that person, which is like a model we use kind of a bunch of places. Right. And the other thing I love about that, both, actually both the brain, sports more so, but the brain as well, is that we always try and pull, put a little bit of that Philly flavor into it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, with sports, it's easy because we're such a sports town. And so getting to work with all of the teams, you know, the professional teams and bringing that identity into the exhibit was really important, you know. It cracks me up that like we did that whole film shoot for the the run where you're racing, you know, different yep. athletes and the Philly fanatic down the middle of the exhibit. Um, and hands down, the fan favorite is the Philly fanatic. Oh, of course. <laughs> really, everyone else like I get it, you can run fast, but I want to run next to the fanatic. Like I would do the same. <laughs> And, you know, my, my, my secret dream is, like, if we have a chance to refurb the sports exhibit, like, we got to get Grady in there. <laughs> I feel like if Grady was involved in a running one, he would either, like, not like he would trip you in, like, a good way, 
and somehow be like, like he actually tripped me, but he's just a scream. Or he would like applaud you along the way. Like Brittany would just take it to a level of like, I you know. do you. <laughs> You're amazing. That would be the Brittany <laughs> approach. Uh, so if we look at like, now we're talking about, you know, idea of Gritty in an exhibit. If you could design like any exhibit, like any exhibit for the museum, what would that exhibit look like in your dream world? What would this exhibit be like? Oh man, that's a hard question. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, think, I think for me, it would be an exhibit that brings in ideas from our community about what we want our future to look like. This is something that we think about a lot uh, in terms of, you know, what are we dreaming about? And yeah. what are the voices in our community that are going to help shape that future? Right. It's, it's, and, and there's so much science and technology embedded in our society every day yeah. um, that, that we can bring to bear on that. But you know, how, how do we bring all of those dreams and visions into an idea that can inspire somebody? I think what I like about that is that you know, the idea of a museum, right, in all these spaces is to educate, but it's at the same time trying to bring people together. You're trying to provide this collective mindset and like a, a branch of learning. And I know when we did the recent work with the like heart exhibit, you know, we got the map in the back, we started incorporating like research from different communities. And it started feeling very much more like, well, this exhibit couldn't exist anywhere else. Like now this exhibit, it feels like this is Philadelphia. Like I'm learning about my own city in that exhibit, which is a fascinating concept and like a great idea for communicating as well. And that's a bridge that you're always trying to, 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 to tackle is that yeah, you know, there is something about science that's universal and you want to hang on to that wonder and curiosity no matter who you are and where you're coming from. But at yeah. the same time, you know, we're we're part of a community. And how do we how do we matter how to, to that community and how do we reflect what's important to, to our neighbors? Now, you know, right now we unfortunately can't be in the building. So what are some things that you like to tell people right now to maintain that curious nature? Like what do you want to tell people who are at home right now, who maybe have kids, don't have kids? Like, how do you, what do you want to inspire them to be creative to do right now? So I think, you know, this is, and I'll, I'll do a little pitch for our Franklin at home <laughs> activities, because I think what we want to get across is that science is happening all around us. Right there is, if you can go outside, you know, and you know, look at the look up at the sky and see the International Space Station. You can go out onto your sidewalk and look in a tree and 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 find some insects or, or flowers that 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 are part of part of this world that we all live in. Um, you can experiment with just like paper and and you know and pennies <laughs> and aluminum yeah. foil and and build boats and and that science too. So, you know, even as we are all confined to our spaces, um, you know, there's, we can keep asking questions and at the same time understand, like take that opportunity to learn about, you know, how science interfaces with the broader society around us too um, and, and how that's shaping, shaping the future as we try and work through this pandemic. Very cool. I mean, it's, it's definitely an impress, important thing to always remain inspired. Like, you know, I'm right now, in my house, I've been here for I don't know time anymore. It's been a, a two months. A <laughs> what year. is time anyway? <laughs> yeah, just make just make up for that one. Um, and there's always like I maybe be staring at something that I stared at for the longest time, and all of a sudden I'll look at it differently, and wow. I'll get inspired by that. Or you know, the person has like a plant in their house, and they're just like always staring. Like now I'm paying more attention to a plant, and I'm just right. learning more. Like during this time of day, it's doing this. Like there's that inspiration that's everywhere. And I think what's really cool kind of bring this all back is that we've been talking, the other initiative with the museum is the My Home Museum. And if the idea of like a museum is like this place that you learn and you gather, the idea that your house and your own collection becomes what you're learning from as well. Um, I know, S sadly, like I feel like my mother was Marie Kondo before Marie Kondo. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> oh, I, I do not have this collecting gene in my body. <laughs> but, so I've been so fascinated in seeing what 
everybody else is collecting and sharing and how that reflects who we are. Yeah. Very cool. So if, so because of that, if you were to have any, if you wish you could have had any collection of something in your house, like what would that collection have been of? You know, the thing that always captures me whenever I go to natural history museums, because clearly I need to go see other people's collections because <laughs> I don't have my own. Um, <laughs> and then this kind of brings me full circle is insects. Like okay. pinned insects to me are this is like a thing of amazing beauty because there's so much diversity and there's so much color um, and they're so interesting in terms of how different adaptations serve different purposes that, you know, to me, just, just that diversity of, of traits and, you know, aesthetics. Um, yes. I love. Like, if, if I had to, you know, cover one wall of my house with the collection, it would be insect. <laughs> That's fat. Yeah, I love it. I love that. Idea. Also because I can't keep a plant alive. You can't keep a plant alive? <laughs> I can't keep a plant alive. <laughs> so I feel like, like I failed as a biologist. <laughs> you're like, one, the item's already dead. I don't got to worry about killing the, the bug. Exactly. Two, it's already displayed and framed. I don't got to put much effort into that one. And three, I'm constantly learning. Like, that's a great combination of a collection. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. Um, so I think we're going to start wrapping up. And so there are there any last things that you want to tell our audience? I mean, and you already covered a lot that's been inspiring about like exhibits, what people can do now and some of our initiatives, but what are some like your final words for our audience out there? Um, let's see. Oh, my, my, my headphones just ran out of batteries. Can you still hear me? I can still hear you. Yes. Okay. Let me, uh, let me, uh, switch my mic. Sorry about that. Okay. No can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, so that is a, such, wow, that, that's a, that's a, that's a hard They're heavy thing. questions, I know. I thought the gin and tonic would settle in, but. <laughs> <laughs> I think, think, it, find wonder in, you know, in, in this small space as, as we're stuck at home. You know, what, what makes you ask how and what makes you ask why? I think one of the, most interesting um, words of inspiration I, I ever heard from an engineer was that, you know, so many inventions come from trying to fix what annoys you. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, even as we're, as, as we're confined to a place where there's probably a lot of things that we're all finding that annoy us, where do you get the opportunity in that? Um, where do you find the unexpected? Um, and, I, and I try to remember that because it's really easy to get kind of like bogged down in, in, in the day to day. But, yeah. you know. Oh, repeat that last part. You broke up a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. That, that you know, it's, it's easy to kind of, you know, get stuck in that rut, you know, when you're stuck in a space. But you never know what's going to surprise you. Um, and so, you know, pay attention to, to those little things. That's a, I think that's a very good way to kind of wrap it up because you know who knows how much longer we've got in this and the idea of just appreciating and just like and just accepting everything and just taking in wonder for all that stuff is a fascinating way to get us through right sometimes they're not going to be great but you need to just like, look around there's a lot around to just enjoy which is a fascinating and, you know, i i'm a total optimist so you know i oh same same i'm like it's gonna be great but sometimes you just need those little reminders of why it's great. And I think it's really good just to look around for those. Right. You know, it's, and it's okay if you don't feel great all the time. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> no one feels great all the time. But every once in a while, look, look for that spark. Love it. I love it. Um, well, Jayatri, I want to thank you very much for coming to the search bar. Um, I hope you enjoy yourself. I definitely enjoyed myself. I love chatting with you as always. It's definitely weird being on the other end. You usually are like the moderator extraordinaire. So being on the opposite end, I found myself being like, she's gonna ask me my next question. I'm like, no, wait, no, nope. I'm the one asking questions. Um, okay, got a good drink in my hand, so. <laughs> how it always works. Um, so we wanna thank you very much, Jay Audrey, and I wanna thank our entire audience out there for tuning in as well. Um, make sure to check out all of our other Franklin at Home programming. You can see Jayatri every week. You can see Derek every week, Rachel, and our other scientists. We're out there while still being here for you. So we want to thank you all very much. Um, and Jayatri, again, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks so much, Adam. That was so fun. 
It was enjoyable. Thank you all again, everyone. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers.